This month on Connections. Our travels take us all over the map, beginning at the Chicago River and the history of how traveling over and under it came to be. Then it's north on the Brown Line. Customers get ready for a massive renovation that will enhance your commute. We transfer to the red line, then to the yellow line for a trip through an impressive renovated station and on to our destination this month, the village of Skokie. Finally, as we make our way to our last stop, we're boarding a bus for a story about how automated voices on buses are making your commute a little easier. It's another Crosstown adventure this month on Connections. Come along for the ride. Hi, I'm Dale Rivera. Welcome to Connections, where you'll find out all there is to know about using public transportation in and around Chicago. Every day, CTA buses and trains cross over one of Chicago's important waterways. It's something we take for granted. And yet, it was no small feat when our forefathers made it possible to travel over and under the Chicago River, our first stop. The Chicago River. It's 156 miles long, 26 feet deep, and home to almost 50 species of fish and birds. About 52,000 vessels travel along the river each year, but it's the time-honored tradition of dyeing the river green on St. Patrick's Day that many folks associate with the river. Chicago tradition that goes back to the, uh, the 1950s, I believe, where they put green dye in the river on St. Patrick's Day. Recorded history of the river dates back to the 1670s when French explorers working for the King of France first discovered it. Pretty quickly, the first Europeans realized that this would be a very important avenue into the interior of the country. And they discovered that at the end of the Chicago River is not too far from where the Des Plaines River comes from, which connects to the Illinois, which connects to the Mississippi. This waterway became an important factor in Chicago's growth. The river here attracted water-based commerce, uh, but then after the railways came here, it was an important avenue for exchanging goods from the river right to rail centers and rail terminals. During the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, the river served as a place of refuge. As the fire came up from the southwest part of the city, it trapped a lot of people uh, on the lake shore. And so uh, people would come out right to this area here and uh, climb on board uh, whatever boats and dinghies uh, and schooners were available to try to escape the flames. But the river has seen many changes since then. It's been straightened, it's been dredged, uh, it's even been reversed in terms of its flow. Uh, Chicago can lay claim to probably doing more with its river and to its river than any other uh, major city. That's right. The Chicago River is the only river in the world that flows backward. Engineers reversed it in the early 1900s for sanitation purposes. That same technology would later be used to build the Panama Canal. Until the late 19th century, there were only a few bridges where people could cross the river on foot. The street railway companies of the time installed tracks on the existing bridges, which allowed a handful of lines to cross it. And those streetcar lines are quite similar to the routes CTA buses follow today. When ridership increased, cable cars were introduced. But the cars couldn't operate across the bridges because the cables had to be continuous and the bridges were movable. Tunnels had to be built under the river to provide a clear path for trains to cross. The Chicago River divides the north and west sides from downtown. And when the elevated railways were built to serve those areas in the 1890s, the only way to get across the river was to extend their elevated structure onto the existing river bridges. Those bridges needed to be strengthened to carry the weight of the trains. Later in the 1920s, the old swing bridges were replaced with the current bascule bridges, which could handle heavier trains and provide a wider passage for river traffic. But bridges didn't resolve all the issues that building transportation around the river presented. The State Street and Dearborn subways were built under the river starting in the late 1930s. For them to get under the river, the State Street subway had a set of steel tubes. Basically, a tunnel section was built in a dry dock, and then it was brought out into the river where State Street crossed and lowered into a trench and then covered over. 
Tunneling for the subways took about three years. Today, those two subways are the CTA's blue and red lines. And all of the other CTA rail lines cross the river at some point. 100 years ago, the river behind me was filled with wharf areas, warehouses and the like. And there were frankly no aesthetic concerns in the minds of the builders of the elevated railways or anything else for that matter. In the 1920s, urban planners envisioned a picturesque Wacker Drive to serve as an attractive focal point for the river, and the unsightly warehouses and wharves were removed. Today, the vision continues. Over the last several years, uh, Mayor Daly ha has had a real strong vision to recapture the river and to revitalize the river and to embrace it. The river has really undergone an, an unprecedented renaissance. As part of its Wacker Drive reconstruction project, the Chicago Department of Transportation not only rebuilt the roadway, but is planning to further revitalize the river, beginning with a new development, Wabash Plaza at the northwest corner of Wabash and Wacker. We're building a very large plaza uh, that will have green space, a terrace lawn. It'll have a brand new Vietnam Veterans Memorial that is going to be the centerpiece of the plaza. We're really creating a user-friendly, a pedestrian-friendly, and a, a downtown-friendly space for people to gather, to have their lunch, to learn a little bit about history, and to embrace the Chicago River as well. And the plaza will be conveniently accessed via the CTA. It's two blocks away from the Red Line State and Lake stop and about three blocks away from the Clark and Lake stop, which serve several L lines. And also there are several bus lines that stop nearby. From a newly discovered transportation and commerce center in the early 17th century, to a transportation challenge in the 18th and 19th centuries, to a local treasure in the 21st century, the Chicago River has certainly come a long way. A lot of people refer to the Chicago River as Chicago's second waterfront, and with all the improvements that have gone on, uh, it's, it's really becoming a, a popular place in downtown Chicago. We're heading north on the Brown Line, where a major expansion program is set to begin. At a time of belt tightening in Washington, the CTA has been able to successfully win funding for this project, designed to make stations accessible for the disabled and increase customer capacity. With similar federal funding, the CTA is currently making major capital improvements on another line as well, the CIRMAC branch of the Blue Line. Improvements you can't help but notice every time you step on board. One, two, three, go. A blue ribbon cutting marked the opening of the Blue Line's new Central Park Station, giving community members and CTA customers a warm welcome on a cold day. This is now the fourth of eight stations that have been completely, are being rebuilt as part of the complete rebuild of the Douglas Branch of the Blue Line, which is a $483 million project. The Central Park Station is a part of the Renew the Blue renovation project, the largest capital improvement project in CTA history. The Pulaski Station is also open for customers to use and enjoy the improved amenities. At the Pulaski Station, customers will find a new bus turnaround that provides convenient drop-off and pickup points under a weather-protected canopy. The platform features overhead heating, benches, enhanced lighting, canopies to shield customers from the elements, and a customer assistance call button. This will enable customers who require assistance on the platform to signal the customer assistant to come up and assist them. And all of the stations, when completed, will be accessible for customers with disabilities, with features that include elevators, message boards, turnstiles to accommodate wheelchairs, TTY telephones, and braille signage. Opening Central Park gives us our fourth accessible station for customers with disabilities. Uh, when we're completed with the rehabilitation of the Douglas Blue Line, we'll have 11 stations that are fully accessible. Adding a bit of color to the stations are photographic glass treatments featured at six of the elevated stations. Each set of images represents a historical or contemporary depiction of the area's landscape. The Renew the Blue project was necessary because the elevated portion of the branch was over 100 years old, and despite efforts to maintain the system with spot replacements, the overall condition had deteriorated to a point that permanent slow zones, which limited trains to speeds as slow as 15 miles per hour, were present throughout more than half the branch. 
Now, five miles of new track and structure along this line will provide faster, smoother rides for the area's many CTA customers. With the new trackage and the new stations, we're taking a 45-minute trip and making it 25 minutes, which will get our customers to the loop even faster. Customers who use the CERMAC branch are excited about the improvements and what it means for the community. It looks really great. Uh, it looks so wonderful uh, compared with the old one, and uh, I think it's a really great time for both communities, North Londell and South Londell. Improving rapid transit service along the CERMAC branch of the Blue Line adds comfort and convenience for CTA customers and will also help attract new customers to the system. Well, it'll make me feel safer. It make me feel warmer on a day like today. And I think it's better for the community. We have a lot of people that need this, this land. So um, I think the improvements will help with the uh, ridership. It's all part of the CTA's overall effort to bring the entire system into a state of good repair. And at the same time, provide an important economic link to the city's west side and western suburbs. I think uh, public transportation is really crucial for our life. Uh, this allows us to go to work, to go to, to the downtown. It connects us to different places where we would like to go around Chicago. We're heading to the northern suburbs on the Red Line, the one CTA rail line that extends all the way north and all the way south. For those of you who use this line, particularly the southern stretch down the middle of the Dan Ryan Expressway, some major improvements are about to begin that will help keep your travel plans on track. The red line is the most heavily traveled line in the entire CTA rail system. More than 208,000 customers use it daily. Southside resident Annette Evans is one of those customers, and she depends on the CTA to get her to and from work safely and on time. It's vital. This is really the only transportation that a lot of people on this side of town have. If you don't have a car, you have to catch the train. Every day, the CTA strives to meet its goal of providing customers with on-time, clean, safe, and friendly service. Sometimes, repairs and upgrades become essential in order to meet that goal, which is why the CTA has begun a multi-million dollar project to improve service on the Dan Ryan branch of the Red Line. It's bringing the CTA up to a state of good repair. It's uh, providing our customers with a, a better, more reliable system. At issue, power, getting enough juice to the third rail to run the train efficiently. The third rail provides the power to the trains. They're fed by the substations, and the 600 volts uh, that the sub substations provide uh, feed the third rail, and the third rail provides power to the train and the train's engine. If that uh, doesn't happen, then uh, the train stops. Since the Dan Ryan branch of the Red Line opened for service in 1969, the CTA has upgraded the trains it uses on its system. Improved customer amenities such as air conditioning require more power from the third rail to operate. In addition, more trains have been put into service on the Red Line over the years to keep up with demand. The extra power required to run an upgraded system resulted in slow zones along the track. The CTA has done a temporary fix to make sure the trains continue to run on time. But now, the real work to fix the problem will begin. They're going to be replacing some of the contact rail, uh, a couple of new, brand new substations. Uh, one substation is being demolished, and two additional substations are being upgraded. Substations will convert the power and feed it directly to the third rail. It's a complex project and a necessary one. In addition to upgrading power generation, seven stations along the line will also be upgraded. They'll expect uh, newly renovated stations, additional elevators at uh, two stations. The escalators will be more reliable. The stations will be well lit. They'll have brand new flooring, tactile edging. It's going to look real nice when they're done. All the work is expected to be completed in late 2006. At the Howard stop, we transferred to the Yellow Line for a straight shot into the northern suburb of Skokie. And at the end of this 2.2 mile ride, how about a $15 million surprise for CTA customers? 
Each month, the CTA's Yellow Line, long known as the Skokie Swift, provides more than 50,000 rides for customers between Howard Station and the village of Skokie. CTA customer DeWitt McLean uses it regularly to get to his job in Chicago. I've been living in Skokie for the past 17, going on 18 years, and uh, when I first got out here, the, the cars were old and the station was old, and now the new one's in place, and it's nice. The new Dempster Street Station was built as part of a massive 12-year project to create this, the Skokie Transportation Center. What the Skokie Transportation Center is, is a endeavor by the village of Skokie to improve the area here on Dempster at the Skokie Swift Terminal to make it more appealing to our customers and their residents. The village of Skokie was able to build the transportation center with state funding. And in addition to the new station, with all the modern amenities, improvements were made to the bus turnaround for customers catching a connecting CTA, Pace, or Greyhound bus. When you get off a bus, you want to get off on the right side and you don't want to cross traffic. And so, um, and we had to bring in the buses here and drop, and drop people off here. But in order to make the improvements, the old station, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, had to be relocated. Moving it was a Actually, it was a riot. They jacked it up, put steel frame underneath, laid down railroad, uh, ta uh, railroad tracks, and put wheels underneath it, and, and rolled it. And then, uh, uh, you know, and then rebuilt it and restored it. What was old is new again. The old station, complete with a Starbucks, is incorporated into the design and connects to a parking lot for customers who want to park and ride. I think this provides an attractive facility that people will be willing to park their car here for $1.75 and take the train to Howard Station or take the train all the way downtown. The more attractive the facility, the more it attracts customers and that's better for us and it's better for Skokie. Many who ride the Skokie Swift feel a sense of nostalgia about it. Unlike the rest of the CTA's rail system, which is powered by an electrified third rail, the yellow line is powered by catenary, or curved cables, above the track that supplies power to the train. But that's about to change. The CTA is working to convert the yellow line to third rail power, making it compatible with the rest of the CTA rail lines while increasing reliability for customers. The catenary is obsolete, so as far as buying parts or re uh, repair parts for it, it's virtually impossible to get, and the, the company is out of business. Uh, secondly, you don't have to use special rail cars, we can use the entire CTA fleet, which gives us a lot more flexibility. Preparation work has already begun to convert to third rail power. Some of that work is happening around grade crossings. And at the same time, the CTA is using the opportunity to improve safety there with new gates and signals. The new Skokie Transportation Center and the Yellow Line Power Conversion. It'll all add up to a swifter ride for CTA customers traveling to and from Chicago's North Shore and a more vibrant Skokie. Transportation is a, a vital component of a healthy community. This fabulous new transportation center is just one example of this community's appeal. But if you get off the yellow line, hop on a bus and start exploring, you'll find many hidden treasures here. Our destination, Skokie. Whether you come to shop, to eat, to play, or relax, you can do it in Skokie. Just ask Elizabeth Kessler, our tour guide for the day. So Elizabeth, tell us why Skokie is such a great destination. Well, Skokie has something for everyone, whether it be families, adults, senior adults. Um, there's a lot of greater recreational, cultural arts. Uh, Skokie is such a diverse community, and, and it's all the eclectic amenities that we have that make it such a wonderful place to come discover. Skokie's rich cultural past began with its founding in 1834, when immigrants from Germany and Luxembourg settled here. Back then, it was known as Niles Center, until it was incorporated as Skokie in 1888. And in the years to come, Skokie became a place where people of cultures from around the world have settled. In fact, Skokie has one of the largest populations of Holocaust survivors in the world. And to honor those residents, a museum, the Holocaust Memorial Foundation of Illinois. We're dedicated to remembering and recording and educating about the Holocaust, teaching people that the Holocaust is not only a Jewish problem, but a human problem. The museum features a permanent exhibition, Voices Still Heard, Witnesses to the Holocaust, which portrays the vitality of pre-war Jewish life, 
seen through the eyes of North Shore Holocaust survivors. What we really try to do is, from a local perspective, make the Holocaust more intimate in the voices that you hear in the exhibit, the artifacts that you see. They are all the artifacts and voices and stories of local survivors that settled here in Skokie. For the art lover in you, check out the Skokie North Shore Sculpture Park. This outdoor public art exhibition features 72 large-scale contemporary sculptures along McCormick Boulevard. Catch the view as you stroll along nearby walking paths. You can also lace up those walking shoes and shop till you drop at the Westfield Shopping Town, formerly known as Old Orchard. This 1.8 million square foot outdoor mall is one of Skokie's biggest attractions. It seems like there's a lot for people to do in Skokie, whether they're individuals or families. Touch on that a little bit. Oh yes, it's more than you can come discover in one weekend. You have to come several times. We have, uh, again, great shopping, great restaurants with a variety of eclectic uh, ethnic restaurants for whatever your taste may be. Um, we also have a lot of wonderful activities at the Skokie Park District. Skokie has one of the most impressive recreational programs around, offering everything from ice skating to physical fitness to rowing? Yes, rowing. And you can train indoors at the Domrick Rowing Center, a state-of-the-art, one-of-a-kind facility. It's a pretty unique facility. The only other facility like this uh, was built in the early 1900s, so this is the first one built in Illinois in almost 80 years. What makes this center unique are the indoor rowing tanks, making it an ideal spot for local high school and college teams to train and novices to learn. Head up, row big, row big. When we teach our classes, uh, that saves us probably four hours of, of time of training out on the water in one one-hour session in the tanks. Um, we can teach you everything how to row except for how to tip a boat in the tanks. On your next day off, consider a visit to Skokie. And to get there, try the CTA. Here's how to do it. So why not explore Chicago and its suburbs on the CTA? We're about halfway through our route on our way to our last stop, the Allstate Arena. To get there from here, we'll be riding on a CTA bus that talks. That's right. A voice now helps customers identify their destinations. And for you to understand how it works, all it takes is a little basic training. Route X49 Express to Evergreen Plaza. If you ride the CTA, that voice may sound familiar. It's the voice of the CTA's new automated voice enunciation system, improving the ride for customers and operators, like Quavel and Jackson. The new system makes my job much easier because the hearing impaired and visually impaired has a better opportunity of hearing and seeing the stops that's being called. Now to ask is where am I going? I'm going from Bryn Mawr and Elston to Harrison and Central. The automated announcement system operates just like a computer. Before the start of their route, bus operators enter their badge and garage numbers and their scheduled route. Then the system identifies the information and automatically sets up destination signs and announcements for that route. Diversity and Elston. By using modern navigation technology, including global positioning satellites, and, a, and what we call logical positioning, the bus is able to identify where it is on its route and display the next stop on the route and make an announcement approximately 400 feet before each stop. What this system does is provide consistent, clear announcements to, to everyone. It's much easier to understand. CTA customers like Brandy Walls notice a difference with the automated announcements. I've noticed that using the automated system makes it much easier because you don't have to differentiate between the bus driver and other customers on the bus. You know it's the bus telling you this is the stop. It just makes everything more efficient. The customers have stated that they love the system. Being able to visually see the stops that's coming up next has been great for them. 
The technology installed on the CTA system has been installed on other public transit systems. But the CTA's fleet is the largest installation yet. Now we do have the third largest bus fleet in the country and we know it's very important to make the bus system more customer friendly, easier to use and ultimately attract more customers to CTA. More than half of the CTA's existing bus fleet has been outfitted with the automated system and every new bus purchased will already come with the system installed. So the next time you ride the CTA, sit back and let the CTA be your guide. In its ongoing effort to meet customers' needs, the CTA periodically conducts service experiments. As part of a service experiment that started in August 2003, the CTA made some changes to bus routes serving customers along both North and South Lakeshore Drive. Throughout the experiment, the CTA has analyzed the impact of the changes and talked to customers who ride those routes. As a result, a number of refinements have been made to these bus routes throughout the six-month experimental period. A new route has been added, the number 148 Clarendon Michigan Express, which will begin service this spring. The route will provide faster service to and from Michigan Avenue for those customers who live north of Irving Park. In addition, the number 145 Wilson Michigan Express route will revert back to its original routing. The CTA has determined that the original routing better meets the needs of customers. Because the experiment is performing as expected, the CTA is adding an additional six-month experimental period to allow CTA staff to continue to monitor and analyze the changes and permit additional customer feedback. You can get more information on these route changes by calling 1-888-YOUR-CTA. The Lakeshore Drive Corridor experiment is doing exactly what it should, helping the CTA to provide fast and convenient service to its customers each and every day. If you're heading to the Allstate Arena, the Blue Line is a great way to go. Just get off here at Rosemont, connect to a bus, and get ready to enjoy a variety of entertainment from music to sports to family events. It's all happening at the Allstate Arena, our last stop. The Allstate Arena is considered one of the crown jewels of the village of Rosemont. It's where every year one and a half million fans of sports, music, and entertainment gather to witness 150 events annually. Our location makes it very convenient for everybody in the six county area to come here and have a fan-friendly environment. You might remember it as the Rosemont Horizon, built in 1979. Today, after a massive renovation and a renaming, the Allstate Arena is one of the largest entertainment facilities in the Chicago area. So the next time you head to the Allstate Arena, why not let public transportation get you there? We'll take you to the Allstate Arena next month as we begin another adventure around Chicagoland. See you next time on Connections. For more information about the CTA or to use the RTA's trip planner, visit our website at www.transitchicago.com or for customer service matters, call 1-888-YOUR-CTA. And for travel information, call the RTA at 836-7000 from anywhere in the Chicago area.
There's nothing I can't find, yeah, I take it everywhere. I've been to Uptown, Downtown, Chinatown, Old Town, Evanston, Pullman, O'Hare, Logan Square, Forest Park, Oak Park, Hyde Park, Lincoln Park, Soldier Field, Rigby Field, Garfield, Marshall Field. I've been everywhere, man. Introducing I've Chicago Cart Plus. The cart is free through March. The newest way to take it everywhere.